heaven. Once again, we praise and thank thee, O Lord, for this time which you have given to us to gather in this wonderful forum set up by the family of Brother Benoni Richards. At this time, as always, O Pastor, we recollect with much thanksgiving the contribution of his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Richards, in starting this Bible study many, many years ago, whereby many of us have been blessed, including this teacher. I call upon your special blessings to be poured upon each and every participant, O Lord. There are nine of them as of now, and those who are going to join. Master, they could have been elsewhere at this point of time, but they have decided to spend this time in your presence because they love you and they want to grow scripturally or sp and spiritually. We commit the next one hour or so into your hands, O Lord. Let every thought, word, and action of us bring thee joy and glory. In Jesus' holy, precious name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. So, as usual, I'll show you the introductory slide, the three-step formula which we use in uh, proceeding with our Bible study. Unless we take all these three steps in the Bible study, the purpose behind Bible study would not be achieved. One is observation, second is interpretation, and third is application. We go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we focus upon the scripture portions as we go progressively. That is called observation, focusing upon the scripture portions as we go progressively, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And then having focused upon the scripture portion, we interpret its meaning. We understand its meaning contextually and we take a 360 degree perspective about the subject which you are focusing upon. And then we come to last but not the least part and that is application. The lessons which we learn, the truths which we imbibe in this Bible study, we have to apply in our day-to-day -day Christian living. Otherwise, the purpose behind Bible study is not achieved. Now, why scriptures have been written, I never tire of making uh, Sister Catherine or Sister Jyoti or Brother Vijay, whoever helps me in uh, scripture reading, I never tire of making them read. So, once again, I am uh, making Sister Jyoti to read two scripture portions. What is the main purpose why scriptures have been written? First is to serve as a warning for us. Second is to engender hope in us. Sister Jyoti, first, uh, first Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. And then these things happen to them. Yeah. These things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Thank you, sister. These things have been written to serve as a warning for us. And then shall we go to Romans 15 4? For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. We might have hope. Now, again, for the benefit of the all the participants, I'm just reminding you that when 1 Corinthians was written or when Romans was written, even the first gospel, Mark, was not written. So what Paul had in mind, because he's the author of both uh, the 1 Corinthians and Roman, Romans, what he had in mind was the scriptures from Genesis to Malachi, why the scriptures have been written. So he did not have any New Testament scripture portions in mind. Because again, I repeat, when 1 Corinthians was written or when Romans was written, even the first gospel was not yet written. And uh, let me again share with you that in the Old Testament scripture portion, there are 928 chapters. Out of this 928 chapters, 917 chapters deal with the history of the nation of Israel. That is from... First chapter to 11th chapter, it is overall earth history or the world history. But from 12th chapter onwards, beginning with the call of Father Abraham, we are going to, we are going to deal or focus only upon the history of the nation of Israel. So from Genesis 12th chapter till the last book, that is Malachi, it's fourth chapter. It is all about the history of nation of Israel. And uh, <clears throat> whenever they have obeyed the Lord, they have been blessed. Whenever they have disobeyed him, they have been cursed. And our God is an unchanging God. Again, I'll make Sister uh, Jyoti to read from Malachi 3.6. Malachi 3.6. Malachi 
So, I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. I, the Lord, do not change. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. <clears throat> the unclean yeah. God, when we disobey him, just as he punished the Israelites, would he not also not punish us? Give me a yes or no. Yes. Yes, right answer. Listen to me very carefully. <clears throat> Uh, those of you who have participated in the Bible study of the book of Revelation, you know that Satan is described as a Satan. Satan is described as a red dragon with seven heads. Why not six heads? Why not eight heads? Reason is those seven heads are symbolizing the seven world empires which have ruled this world. After Adam fell into sin, by default, Satan became the king of this world. That is why our Lord Jesus Christ himself says, uh, you know, before he is betrayed in um, the upper room, he says in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 30, the prince of this world is approaching me. The prince of this world is approaching me. So, uh, dear friends, uh, I'll make uh, Sister Jyoti to read that scripture portion also. Uh, Ma Jyoti, please read from uh, this scripture portion. That is uh, <clears throat> John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 30. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself is Ad addressing Satan as the prince of this world. I will no longer speak with you much longer for the prince of this world is coming. He yes. has no hold on me. Thank you, sister. So, the seven world empires going in chronological order is first is Egypt, second is Assyria, third, look at uh, Brother Chandu immediately is, uh, uh, you know, is displaying the right scripture portion. First is Egypt. Brother Chandu can point a culture also. Second is Assyria. Third is Babylonians. Fourth, Medo Persians. Fifth, Greece. Sixth is Romans. And the seventh one to come is that of Antichrist. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Question is when the Lord delivered the Israelites from the Egyptian slavery, virtually speaking, from whose hands was he delivering them? Give me an answer. Egyptians. Only Egyptians, when he's delivering them from the hands of the Egyptians, virtually from whose hands is he delivering them? Brother uh, Chandu. Uh, right answer. Satan. 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 Because Satan. all these world empires, global empires, belong to Satan. So he was delivering them virtually from the hands of Satan. And we know in Israeli history, listen to me very carefully. We know in Israeli history that after they occupied the promised land, after they received a lot of blessings after blessings, even as they were virtually enjoying a little heaven on earth, when they became idol worshippers, God handed them over into the hands of the Babylonian king. So again, I'm asking you a question. The same Lord who delivered Israelites from the hands of Satan, when he was handing them over into the hands of the Babylonian king to take them into exile, into whose hands was he virtually handing them over? Satan. Give me an answer, no? Satan. Loudly, ma. Satan. Satan. Right answer. He is an unchanging God. And let us come to Christians. Why scriptures have been written? To serve as a warning for us. When we accept Christ, when we become Christians, he delivers us from the hands of the devil. We have all along been Followers of the devil, we have all along been in the hands of the devil. So he is delivering us from the hands of the devil when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But if we disobey God after becoming Christians, after having been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, the unchanging God can hand us over back into the hands of the devil so that the devil will show us a little hell on earth. He will expose us to little hell on earth and then we will not have the courage to sin again. Is it written in the scriptures that Christians can be also be handed over back into the hands of the Satan? Yes. Turn with me to uh, Sister Jyoti will help us out. First Timothy chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. First Timothy chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. Underline this in your Bibles. First Timothy chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. Hold on. Timothy, my son, I give you these instructions in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, holding on to the faith and a good conscience. 
Some have rejected these and have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Herminius and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. I have handed them over into the hands of Satan. Our God is unchanging God. Are you all with me? If he is delivering the Israelites from the Egyptian slavery, he can hand them back into the hands of the Babylonian king, who is also a representative of the devil. So scriptures have been written to serve as a warning for us. Then it is also written to serve and engender hope in us. When David was ruling, when Solomon was obedient, dear friends, that was the golden era of the Israeli history. Whatever they touched turned gold. It was like they were having Midas touch. Now, because this is Bible study, I'm going so deep. Okay. David became the benchmark for other kings in the matter of obedience because David's reign symbolized the golden era of the Israeli period or the Israeli history. Shall we look at uh, Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse 1, sister? All the next kings who came after David, they were compared with David. David became the benchmark for obedience because his reign was the golden period in the Israeli history. Second Corinthians chapter 28 was? No, second Chronicles, sister. Second Chronicles. Chronicles chapter 28 was, was one. Was. Ahaz was 28 years old, 20 years old, when, the king, when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Unlike David, his father, compared to David, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Similarly, let us go to the next chapter, sister. Chapter 29. Please read the first two verses. Again, there is a description of Ahaz's son, King Ezekiel. And his Hezekiah obedience was, is also compared to David's obedience. Yeah. Ezekiel was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David has done. Look at that. David is the benchmark. Now, since this is Bible study, I'm going slightly deep. And all of you are going to be future teachers of God's word. Say Amen wherever you are. So, the, just before I come to the main point today, even though all the history of the na uh, nation of Israel, all the kings list is given in, in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 2 Kings. I repeat, in this four books, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Which, is, which was actually only one book in Hebrew Bible. After it got translated into Greek, because there are bubbles in Greek, which is not there in Hebrew, the book size of kings became big. So for easier study, it got split into four books, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Otherwise, it was just one book in the original Hebrew Bible. Are you with me? Now, when the list of the kings and their actions their type of reign, the way they followed the Lord, all this is there in the four books. Why again First Chronicles and Second Chronicles were written? What could be the reason? It was written by Ezra. Why? When already the history of all the kings has been mentioned in this four books, First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings and Second Kings, why did Ezra write First Chronicles and Second Chronicles? Actually, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles is also just one book, Chronicles, after it got translated into Greek. Because there are vowels, the book size became big, and that's why it got split into First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. <clears throat> Listen to me very carefully. Ezra wrote this book when the exiles had returned from the Babylonian exile to Jerusalem. And even as they were reconstructing the temple, they were facing obstacles. <clears throat> they were facing difficulties because in the 70 years absence of the Jews in the land of Israel, Samaritans were there, other Gentiles were there. They did not welcome the Jews with a red carpet when they came back. And even as the Jews were trying to reestablish themselves in the land of Israel, you know, there, was, there were obstacles from, there were problems coming from the Samaritans and other Gentiles. And even as the Jews were reconstructing the temple, they were facing some kind of discouragement because often these Samaritans and other Gentiles would come and obstruct their work. That is when Ezra sat down and wrote 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. The highlight of 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles is 
the glory of David's empire and the glory of Solomon's empire when Solomon was obedient, which is brought out in great detail in First Chronicles, is not there in First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings, and Second Kings. I repeat. Ezra brought out in greater detail the glory of David's empire, which you will not <laughs> be able to read in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And the glory of uh, Solomon's empire when he was obedient has been elaborated in the book of 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. You know why? He wanted to show this discouraged Jews who had come back from the Babylonian exile and were resettling in the land of Canaan once again. He wanted to encourage them. He wanted to show them, hey, look at your ancestors, David and Solomon. You are their children. When you are obedient, God is going to be with you. And you shall also flourish. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. That is why 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles were written. He brought out the glory of David's empire. He brought out the glory of Solomon's empire when Solomon was obedient. In 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles, which is conspicuous by its absence in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Are you all with me? So tomorrow you are all going to be Bible teachers. If somebody asks you a question, hey, why 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles is written when already all the details about the kings are there in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, your answer shall be, it was written basically to encourage the Jews who had returned from the Babylonian Empire or who had returned back from the Babylonian exile. To encourage them, to show them how when God is with the kings, when God is with the Jews, when they are obedient, they will flourish like anything. They will flourish like anything. Are you all with me? That is why First Chronicles and Second Chronicles were, was, were written. So, dear friends, we are serving the same unchanging God as Christians. When we are obedient, yes, blessings are bound to follow. Blessings are bound to chase us. And the greatest blessing is, he'll be with us. Are you all with me? What is the greatest blessing a Christian can have? To have the Lord is on our side. So even if there are problems all around, if the Lord is with us, there is nothing to stop us. Turn with me to Romans 8.31. Sister Jyoti, Romans 8.31. Underline it in your Bibles. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. This is the truth which Ezra wanted to emphasize by writing 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. Are you all with me? So, dear friends, why scriptures have been written? Because this is Bible study only, I am going so deep. Okay? So, <clears throat> why scriptures have been written? First, to serve as a warning for us. And second, to engender hope in us. We are serving the same unchanging God. If we are disobedient, yes, chastisement will come our way. If we are obedient, he is going to be with us. If he is with us, Red Sea will open, Jordan River will open, Jericho Wall will fall down. Are you all with me? With this in background, shall we go to uh, the next slide, uh, Brother Chandu? We take a 360 degree perspective of any uh, subject which we come up across. Uh, for instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, it says, the Moabites shall not enter the assembly of God. Yes, why God asked Moses to write down that law? We know the background. Moabites were very, very unfriendly with the Jews when they were returning to, uh, when they were coming to Canaan from Egypt. So that is why that curse was there. But when we take our 360 degree perspective, if a Moabite sincerely searches God, if he sincerely wants to set right his or her relationship with God, then the Lord will accept him. Would The Lord would accept her. Uh, so, uh, dear friends, I'm going to ask you a question. To which nation did Ruth belong? Give me Moabite. an answer. Moabite. Moabite, right answer. So, we take a 360 degree perspective. We, don't, we just don't look at one scripture portion and say that is the final conclusion. That is the Lord's counsel on that matter. No. Similarly, Deuteronomy 24. Uh, diverse is permitted, but what is the Lord's counsel? As regards marriage, we have to look at the entire scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Are you all with me? So we take a 360 degree perspective. Now let's go to the next slide. 
we we have start we had started chapter 26 in our last uh, study the first 15 verses we have seen uh, dear friends again i am sharing with you that we use col uh, color coding in the study of book of deuteronomy uh, green color is to symbolize those subjects which have already been focused upon in the first four books of the bible or in the book of deuteronomy itself in the previous chapters and red color is to symbolize those subjects which are unique to the book of Deuteronomy or unique to that chapter in the book of Deuteronomy. Are you all with me? So uh, we have already seen re recollect and reward. The first fruits belong to the Lord because he is the person who is giving us everything. We owe our existence to him. Every cell in our body has been created by him. And dear friends, no scientist has yet to find out the every cell in the spirit of a person. <laughs> so if at all somebody finds out every cell in the spirit of a person also, that every cell also has been created by our Heavenly Father only. Are you all with me? So we owe our very existence to Him. So whatever we receive from Him, since it has come from Him, we honor Him by giving the first fruits, be it our first salary, be it our first crop, be it our first son. <laughs> that is the uh, the Jewish custom <clears throat> in the land of Israel. Their first son, their first harvest, their first uh, you know yield in the agriculture, their first uh, offspring of their cattle. The and uh, the equivalent of that would be in the Christian context, perhaps our first uh, income on the if we have entered into business or our first salary if we have got our job. So. Everything has come from the hands of the Lord. We honor him by giving the first fruits thereof. We are acknowledging by giving it to the Lord that, Lord, we have received it from you. Okay. And uh, to whom do we give? <clears throat> that is important. Shall we go to the next slide? And how do we give? Some insightful statements which we focused upon last week also. Thanksgiving is not complete without giving. You can split that word thanksgiving into two parts. Thanks and giving, and both become acceptable to God. These two words, when they are co joined, they become acceptable to God when only when both are there. Okay, look at Brother Chandu immediately making a, a spelling adjustment. Thanks and giving is not complete without giving. We can easily say, Oh, thank you, Lord, for giving me a good job. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a profitable business. But if our thanks uh, is limited to only verbal or vocal, then it is not true thanksgiving. <laughs> true thanksgiving goes beyond vocal and verbal expressions. So <clears throat> how are we giving and to whom are we giving? Again, the second statement is by tithing, a Christian may, not, may or may not grow. But if he has grown, he would tithe. Grown means he is spiritually mature. Dear friends, <laughs> growing into Christ-like image means what? Thinking like Christ, having the mind of Christ, behaving like Christ, responding to situations like Christ. And what is the yet another name for our Lord Jesus Christ? The Word of God. If you have understood the Word of God, you have understood Jesus Christ. If you have understood Jesus Christ, you have understood the Word of God. Are you all with me? So, by tithing, a Christian may or may not grow. There is no guarantee. But if he has grown, if he is thinking like Christ, then he would tithe. Are you all with me? Because in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 23, I'll make Sister Jyoti to read it again. Jesus is endorsing tithing. He says, please tithe, but do not neglect other important things also, like being fair, like being merciful, like being kind. Sister Jyoti, Matthew's Gospel, 23, 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of his spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Yeah. You give tithes. At the same time, do not neglect. Do not be uh, <clears throat> easygoing. Do not be indifferent to the needs of others. Be fair, be merciful, be gracious. So our Lord Jesus Christ himself is endorsing tithing. Okay, let's go to the next slide, sister. Well, let's go to the next slide, Brother Chandu. Here, this is very, very important. 
the real way to know how much you love somebody is how much you are willing to give to that person. Timothy Keller is a very famous uh, preacher, very wise preacher. The real way to know how much you love somebody is how much you are willing to give. Dear friends, God is unseen, but God's representatives are right in front of us. The pastors, the apostles, the preachers, the evangelists, the teachers, the fivefold ministry of the church, who are the ordained ones, who are the equivalent of the Levites in the New Testament, the equivalent of the Levites in the New Testament who are not allowed to do any business or who are not allowed to get into any employment, are the, the fivefold ministry of the church. Some are apostles, some are evangelists, some are prophets, some are pastors, some are teachers. Now, they are not allowed in the New Testament to do business or get into any employment. If they were to give, do business or get into any employment, dear friends, half their time would be spent uh, in take, uh, taking care of their business matters. Half their time would be uh, spent in taking care of their superiors' interests or their company interests if they are employed. How would they spend time? in the presence of the Lord, learn lessons from him and impart to the other Christians. It will not be possible. So, <clears throat> God is not seen. We cannot see God physically, but his representatives are right in front of us. If we love God, we would give liberally to his representatives who are in front of us. And apart from God's servants, apart from God's representatives, who else are there who are Virtually representatives of God. If we love God, we would love them also. They are the ones who cannot huh, help you back. The orphans, the widows, the foreigners. And now I'll make Sister uh, Jyoti to read because this is from verses 1 to 15. I put uh, Deuteronomy 26, 13 in red color to uh, basically to highlight that. Apart from the Levites, apart from the full-timers, who else are there? Where we can show our love by way of liberal giving, by way of our generosity. Uh, Sister Jyoti, Deuteronomy 26 13. 26 13. They say to the Lord your God, I have removed from my house the sacred portions and have given it to the Levite, the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all you commanded. Look at that. Alien means what? Foreigner. Somebody like Lu Ruth who had come there seeking God's grace. Fatherless means orphans, widows, you know. Dear friends, I'm asking you a question. When you give to God's servants, when you give to the orphans, when you are generous with the widows, can they financially or socially help you back? Give me mm -hmm. a short no. Socially, can they help you back? No. Or financially, no. can they help you back? No. It is symbolizing your agape love, your selfless love. In Greek language, there are three words to describe love. One is eros, second is philos, and third is agape. Eros is a love which is selfish. It 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 it, it is like you know getting spirit uh, physical enjoyment out of a bodily sexual relationship. Again, I'm telling eros or erotic love is all about getting sexual enjoyment out of sexual relationship. Huh? What is I'm getting out of it? That is the uh, that is in the mind of a person who is indulging in erotic love. Philos, philos is I will love a person. I will give to him. I will also expect something to him. I will give, but I will also expect something from him. It, it should be mutually be beneficial. That is philos love. Agape love is giving without expecting anything in return. Orphans and widows, huh? pastors and God, full-time God servants cannot help us back socially. They cannot help us back financially. But when you are giving to them, you are giving out of agape love. What does James say? Uh, sister, Brother Chandra, let's go to that same slide. Uh, what does James say in James chapter 1 verse 27? The religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, uh -huh. to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
the true religion accepted by our heavenly father is to take care of orphans and widows because they cannot help you back. How much you love God is shown by way of your generosity, by way of your charity towards those who cannot help you back socially or financially. Are you all with me? And uh, our Lord Jesus Christ is taking the Pharisees and Sadducees to task. Uh, in New Testament times, they were uh, the leaders of the society. Again, I'm, this is because this is a Bible study, I'm going deep. Listen to me very carefully. The Israeli history, the scriptural history of 2000 years can be split into four parts. Listen to me very carefully. The scriptural history of Israel spanning 2000 years can be split into four parts, all lasting for approximately 500 years. Okay? I'm using peace. First P is the patriarchal age, starting with Abraham and ending with Abram, that uh, uh, ending with Amram, that is the father of Moses. Okay, <clears throat> that is first 500 years. Second 500 years is that of prophets, starting with Moses, ending with Samuel. Okay, next 500 years period is that of princes, starting with King Saul and ending with King Zedekiah in Second Chronicles chapter 36. And the fourth part is that of priests, priests, starting with Joshua who was a very devout priest. And then we come to Maccabees, who was also a Pharisee, but a very devout Pharisee, uh, committed to Lord's work. When the Greeks took over Jerusalem and defiled the temple, Maccabees put his life to risk. He was a Pharisee, fought with the Jews, recaptured Jerusalem, recaptured the temple cleansed it once again because they had defiled uh, the Jewish temple. He was a very good Pharisee. But during Jesus' time, the same Pharisees and Sadducees continued to be leaders. Anna and Caiaphas, they were very, very corrupt, very, very selfish. And the very widows they were supposed to take care of, they were exploiting them. Just uh, let us look at this scripture portion also. Uh, Chandu, let's look at that slide. Matthew's Gospel Chapter 23, verses 14 onwards. Sister Jyoti will read it out for us. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, verses 13 and 14. The very people whom this priest should take care of, they were exploiting them. Yeah. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourself do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you take you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Continue, sister. Woe to you, woe to you blind guides. You say, if anyone sways by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone sways by the gold of the temple, he is bound by the oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone sways by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone sways by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Sister, they please read from uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 40. Mark's Gospel, again, the same speech is there in Mark's Gospel also. Chapter 12, verse 40. They devour widows, house, houses, and for a show make lengthy praise. Such men will be punished more severely. Look at that. They cheat widows and steal their houses. See, what uh, uh, in the Jewish society a man would do is, he would think this priests, this Pharisees, this Sadducees are honest men. And uh, he would include their name in his will, saying that, you know, you're also part of the will as a part of the witness. Ensure that when I die, my property is safely handed over into the hands of my wife. Since their names are there in the will as witnesses, as those who have to execute that will to ensure that, you know, when a Jewish man dies, his property is safely passed over into the hands of his widow. Because their names are there, they would twist the laws this side and that side. They would exploit the situation. A poor widow is not having anybody to fight for her. 
they would take over of the they would take over the property that that is the contextual meaning those uh, those of us who have studied the bible commentaries those of us who know who have read uh, jamison fawcett brown uh, commentary on what is the meaning of mark's gospel chapter 12 verse 40 what is the meaning of jesus accusing these pharisees and sadducees of stealing the houses of the jews houses of the jewish widows the meaning is when a jewish male is writing his will he thinks, Are, this man is very honest, this Sadducee, this Pharisee. Most of the times he's working in the temple. So as he's working in the temple, he has the fear of God. He is going to ensure that my property safely passes on to my wife when I die. But these fellows, being middlemen, they would, you know, exploit that situation, not hand over the property to the Jewish widows, but take over that. Look at that. The very widows they were supposed to take care of, they were exploiting. So uh, why I'm going so deep is, dear friends, we take a 360 degree perspective. Whenever we touch upon any subject, we see what all is written about that subject in the entire scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Are you all with me? That is why I'm bringing the New Testament angle also into taking care of widows. So now I'm going to ask you a question. These very men who are most of the times inside the temple, Listen to me very carefully. So-called so serving God. If they had really loved God, would they not love the widows also? Give me a yes or no. If they had really loved God, would they exploit the widows? No. Right answer. So this is a case of being so near, yet so far. Are you all with me? This is a case of being so near. Half the time, these Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests were in a uh, Jewish temple, close to the physical presence of God. But their hearts were very far from him. If they had truly loved God, they would not exploit the widows. Are you all with me? How much you love the unseen God is demonstrated by how you love his representatives in front of you. So, Dear friends, <clears throat> whenever the Lord blesses us materially, financially, we are duty-bound to show our gratitude by giving it to his genuine servants. When I say genuine servants, I am emphasizing it. Please, many people may be there saying, I am a servant of God. I am serving him, so on and so forth. A tree is known by its fruit. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. God has given the wisdom to know who is a genuine person and who is not a genuine person. A tree is known by its fruit. So, whom we feel are genuine, as the Lord blesses us materially and financially, we are duty-bound to support them. Similarly, we are duty-bound to support the orphans and widows. Are you all with me? That is the Christian application of the Bible study. Let's go to the next slide, brother. Now, before I come to the 27th chapter, I'm bringing out what is called the metaphysical phrase. Okay? This is, in English, this is known as metaphysical phrase. Remembering to remember. Similarly, there are other metaphysical phrases in English. Another example I'm giving you is uh, prophesying about prophecy. <laughs> what will be your prophecy about prophecy? Prophecy. Is going to be fulfilled. <laughs> Are you with me? Just giving you an example of metaphysical phrases in English. Prophesying about prophesying. Uh, sorry, prophesying about prophecy. What will be a prophecy about a prophecy? It will be fulfilled. Okay. Similarly, why I'm showing this remembering to remember is only when we, dear friends, recollect what all God has done for us, then only gratitude wells up in our heart. When gratitude wells up in our heart, love also wells up. When love is increasing, our commitment to him increases. When our commitment to him increases, our testimony becomes great. So everything depends upon our gratitude welling up. And gratitude will well up only when we recollect and remember what all he has done in your life. So dear friends, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, 
the word remember is used 15 times and the, the Hebrew notation also I brought out in front of you. Uh, that is uh, word remember for, in Jewish language is zakar. Brother Chandu uh, point uh, uh, Karzer at zakar. Yeah, zakar. That means uh, meaning is remember. And then uh, point of uh, Karzer at uh, the Hebrew notation also. Okay, that is the Hebrew notation for that. Now, with this in background, let us look at the last three verses of chapter 27. Okay, let's go to uh, 16 to 19, Sister Jyoti. When the Israelites remember that their calling is very holy, they have had privileges which other nations have not had. Then the gratitude is supposed to go up in their hearts. Uh, Sister 16 to 19. The Lord your God commands you this day to follow these decrees and laws. Carefully observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared this day that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in his ways, that you will keep his decrees, commands and laws, and that you will obey him. And the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured position. His treasured possession. You are his treasured possession. Ah. As he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame and honor, high above all the nations. High above all the nations. That is why we are using that word raised. Raised, high above all nations. Ah. High above all nations he has made. And that you will be a people holy to the Lord your God, as he promised. Thank you, sister. So, raised, rededicated and renewed. When they recollect their holy calling, when they recollect the special blessings they have got from the Lord, what would well up in their hearts? Gratitude. Are they? When compared to others, I'm so special. When compared to others, I've got this kind of special treatment. Let us look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6 also, sister. How Israel has been described. Deuteronomy 4, 6. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Wow. The Jewish people are so wise. So orderly is their society. We see perfect functioning in their society. There is no disorder at all. Our God is a God of order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. There is orderly working of the Jewish society. People will appreciate your nation. So they are a special nation. Now again, Deuteronomy 7, 6 also, sister. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured position. Look at that. When the privilege is high, to whom much is given from him, much is expected. Now, dear friends, Bible study is not complete till we come to the New Testament portion and apply it in our own Christian living. If the Israelites are a treasured possession of the Lord, what makes us more special? I'm asking a question. You can... Unmute and give me an answer. Thank if you. the Israelites are a treasured possession of the Lord, what makes Christians more special than even the Israelites? Temple of the we Lord. are the temple, temple of, God. of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The spirit of the Lord indwells us. Dear friends, in uh, Old Testament times, the treasured people of the Lord constructed the temple. The Lord's presence was with them in anti dispensation. It is in us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Sister Jyoti. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Underline this in your Bibles. All the Bible study students. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Galatians 4.6. Again, we are the temple of God. The spirit of Jesus, spirit of God's son is indwelling Be us. Mm. Because your sons, 
God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba Father. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. You know, before the spirit of the Lord came into the Jewish temple, when we read uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, uh, I'll make Sister Jyoti to read that. Countless sheep were sacrificed by Solomon to consecrate that temple. You know, uh, please uh, read this, Sister. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 6. As Solomon was building the temple, as he was consecrating it, the Lord's Spirit did not come inside the temple till what happened? Uh, Sister is reading it out. Second Chronicles and King Solomon 5, 6. Yeah. And the entire assembly of Israel that had gathered about him were before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded or counted. So many sheep, innumerable sheep were sacrificed to consecrate the temple. The, the shedding of the innocent blood of innumerable sheep made the temple pure and fit for God's presence, for God's spirit to come inside the temple. Uh, sister, read the last three verses of that same uh, chapter from verse 13 onwards. Second Chronicles. Same. Second Chronicles 5. Okay. Yeah, verse 13. The, Please underline this in your Bibles. Uh, all the, the trumpeters. Yeah. The trumpeters and singers join in unison as with one voice to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang. He is good, his love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Array, so much of preparation was required to consecrate the temple, whereby finally we see the Spirit of the Lord coming inside the temple. And our hearts, Christian hearts, have been cleansed, not by the blood of the lambs, not by the blood of the sheep, not by the blood of the bulls, but by the blood of his only son, Jesus Christ, making our hearts as the temple of God. Are you all with me? Are you understanding? So what about that same submitting for us Christians, raised? Rededicated, renewed. Why do we participate in the Lord's temple? Uh, sorry, why do we participate in the Lord's table week after week? To remember what cost our Lord Jesus Christ to make us his temple. Brother Chandu, let's look at that slide. <clears throat> why do we participate in the Lord's table week after week? Even as we are participating in the Lord's table, Renewing our first love. Dear friends, one biblical scholar, uh, look at that, Lord's Table, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17. Why do we, 17 to 34, why do we participate? To recollect what cost our Lord Jesus Christ, what price he had to pay to make us temples of God, to put us at a higher pedestal when compared to the Jews. Jews, as it is, they are a treasured position. But will any Jew get this title that he is the temple of God? No. Are you all with me? And when I interact with the Jewish rabbis, I try to make them jealous by saying, see, I am the temple of God. You have done a good job. You have constructed God's temple. But here I am temple of God. I try to bring jealousy in them so that they'll try to have what we have. Are you all with me? So, Raised, Brother Chandu, let's look at that slide. Raised, rededicated, and renewed. Now, why am I showing uh, an elderly couple, the picture of the elderly couple? You know what one great biblical scholar said about marriage? Marriage means falling in love many times, but always with the same person. These two are an elderly couple who have been perhaps been married for maybe 50 years or more. What is good marriage? Good marriage means falling in love again and again, but always with the same person. Similarly, what is good spiritual life or what is good Christian life? Falling in love with our Savior again and again. Dear friends, everything was ritualistically perfect in the church at Ephesus. 
Now I'm going to ask you a question and test your Bible knowledge. Everything ritualistically was perfect in the, in the church at Ephesus. When Jesus is speaking to them in Revelation chapter 2, what was missing out in them? Anybody can unmute and give me an answer. First love. First love, right answer. That fervor, that passion, which they had when they had uh, become Christians many years ago, that fervor, that passion was coming down. Yeah. Are you all with me? So, dear friends, what is the purpose of Bible study? Unless we connect it to the New Testament portion, the purpose behind Bible study is fully not achieved. So, these were 16 to 19, which was meant to make them more and more grateful to God who had called them as his treasured possession. That's why they were raised. They were at a high level when compared to other nations. So they have to rededicate themselves and renew their love for him. Are you all with me? And now, let me go more deep. <clears throat> what was the kind of land which God had given to the Israelites? Virtually a little heaven on earth. Virtually a little heaven on earth. Uh, uh, Sister Jyoti will be reading it out for us from Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 11. A fertile land. See, I have been to Jer mm -hmm. Israel. I can speak with conviction and authority. The size of the grape in India will be of this size. In Israel, the size of the grape will be this big. In India, the size of pomegranate will be this much. In Israel, the size of pomegranate will be this much. Land full of fertility. Literally a little heaven on earth. So what does Deuteronomy 11.11 11 say? But the land you are crossing, the Jordan to take position is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. That drinks rain from heaven. Ah. It is a land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. Look at that. For Thailand, it drinks rain from heaven. Reason also, geographical reason I'm showing you by way of next line. Brother Chandu, uh, it's a place of hills and valleys. And we all know the sea abutting the land of Israel is the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. So what happens is, it's a place of hills and valleys. Okay. So when the in the summer hot season, when... The, in the Mediterranean Sea, the water evaporates and forms into clouds. As the clouds are passing the land of Israel, the mountains obstruct them. Where the mountains obstruct them, immediately precipitation takes place. Now, Brother Chandu, just uh, point a, a cursor at uh, the condensing water vapor and the precipitation which is taking place as the cloud is coming in contact with the mountains. Okay, As the cloud is coming in contact with the mountains, Look at the precipitation which is taking place, okay? <clears throat> because the mountains are not allowing the clouds to pass easily, okay? So that is why Deuteronomy 11, 11, it says, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, a uh, land of hills and valleys which drinks rain from the skies, okay? Are you all with me? So now when you come to New Testament, our Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount is upping the ethical values of Christians, Okay? In the, new, in the Old Testament dispensation, it was eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But Lord Jesus Christ says, love your enemies. Now, as per the OT dispensation, adultery is sin. But our Lord Jesus Christ says, looking at a virgin with lustful eyes is adultery. In Old Testament dispensation, murder is sin. But our Lord Jesus Christ says, getting angry is equivalent to committing a murder. So, our Lord Jesus Christ in New Testament dispensation is upping the ethical values. Now, dear friends, using Hyderabadi colloquy, hmm? Hyderabad colloquy is Urdu colloquy. You know what it says? Ek haath se do, dusre haath se le lo. <laughs> Ek haath se do, dusre haath se means be fair, give this and take this. So, God is expecting full commitment and obedience uh, amongst the Israelites when he has given them a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, let me ask Sister uh, Catherine, who is in uh, Mangalore. 
Sister uh, Catherine, do you see land flowing with milk and honey around you? <laughs> no, no, Pastor. Then Only why is our Lord Jesus Christ upping the ethical values or the ethical expectations of us? Is he unfair? He is not unfair. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Our God can never be unfair. He is making us virtually experience heaven in our heart. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. By placing the Holy Spirit in us. And the Holy Spirit doesn't come with empty hands into our hearts. He brings the heavenly peace. He brings the heavenly joy. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Are you all with me? How much more we are committed to Christ now? What is the meaning of the word? Kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. Jesus says repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Means when you repent, when you accept him, when you receive him, uh, the kingdom of God which is near enters your heart. What is it? To understand the Bible, you have to use the Bible. To interpret the scripture, you have to use the scripture. Uh, now Sister Jyoti will be helping us out. Romans 14, 17. What is kingdom of God? Repent for it is near. So when you repent, it Amen. enters your heart. What for the kingdom you? of God, hmm. for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It is not a matter of eating and drinking in the promised land. Ah. But of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wherever you are, say hallelujah. Look at the wording. Look at the sequencing of the wording. I always say not only is the entire scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit, the sequencing of the words in the scripture is also inspired by the Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus Christ tells the Samaritan woman, a time would come when we need to worship him in spirit and in truth. He doesn't say in truth and in spirit. Why? Why is he using the word spirit front in before the word truth? Unless the Holy Spirit helps us, our worship will not be truthful. Our worship will not be tasty to our Heavenly Father. It will not be acceptable to him. Her question was, Lord, we worship, Samaritans worship God at Mount Gerizim. You worship him in Jerusalem. Which worship will God accept? So our Lord Jesus Christ replies, a time would come when our Lord would be looking for worship, which is done in spirit and in truth. Not in truth and in spirit. The sequencing of the words is also inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now listen to me very carefully. Kingdom of God, just now Sister Jyoti read, it doesn't say peace, joy of the Holy Spirit and righteousness. No. What, what is kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit. What is righteousness? Righteousness means right relationship with God. When do you get right relationship with God? When you repent and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And once you are counted as righteous, the Holy Spirit comes inside, bringing the heavenly peace and heavenly joy. No wonder we are expected to be more ethical than the Jews. Are you all with me? To whom much is given, from him much is expected. There it is, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But here, love your enemies. Why? Is God unfair by upping the ethical values or upping his ethical expectations of us? No. He is making us virtually taste heaven on earth. Are you all with me? I will make Sister Jyoti to read the scripture portion and I am ending the Bible study. I'm going to ask you a question. Whether this particular verse is there in past tense or in future tense. Okay? Sister Jodi, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Listen to this scripture portion carefully and then you will have to give me an answer whether it has been written in future tense or present tense. Okay? But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sister. Uh, is it in uh, past tense, present tense or in future tense? Past tense. Past tense. He has seated us in heaven already. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It doesn't say he's going to seat us in heaven in the coming days. No. A Christian is already seated in heaven means what? His body is here on earth. 
but his spirit is having a foretaste of heaven already. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Are you all with me? This is kingdom of God. And dear friends, a person who has tasted kingdom of God, he'll give up anything but retain it. Uh, I'm inspired to share this also. Sister Jyoti, read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 45. What is kingdom of heaven? What is kingdom of God? It is like a valuable pearl, which a pearl merchant has found out. And then he is selling his entire property to get hold of that pearl. Sister, uh, that okay. is yeah, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of the great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. And got it. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Dear friends, when the Lord called me to full-time work, I was working as a marketing manager in Indian Oil Corporation with a very fat salary. As I did not immediately respond, saying, Oh Lord, I am in central government organization. I'm having a pensionable job, a very fat salary, very good social status. Temporarily, the joy and peace of the Holy Spirit left me. The right relationship with God got affected. And then I fell at Jesus' feet. I said, Lord, I want your presence. I want right relationship with you. I want peace. I want joy. I do not want this job. If you are wanting me to give up this job and to become a full-timer, yes. So this is just not an uh, 2,000 years back experience. It's like a pearl, which a pearl merchant has found out and then sold everything to get hold of that pearl. That is the experience of every Christian in the last 2,000 years. Are you all with me? Our privilege is greater. And from us, he expects more. Are you with me? So how are we faring on these three hours? Raised, rededicated, and renew. Are you all with me? How are we faring? God is having expectation of the Jews in Deuteronomy. What is our? What is his expectation when it comes to us? In the matter of we being elevated, being put at a high pedestal, given the high privilege of being temples of God, enjoying virtually a little heaven on earth, are we rededicating ourselves day by day, renewing our gratitude for him? Because greater the gratitude, greater the love, greater the love, greater the commitment, greater the commitment, greater the testimony, greater the testimony, more unbelievers will be attracted to Jesus. Are you all with me? So I'm closing here now. I'll offer a small closing prayer and Sister Kathleen will be leading us in formal closing prayer. Okay. Father in heaven, once again, we praise and thank thee, O Lord, for this wonderful time which you have given to us to study the scriptures. Learn from the scriptures. Apply the truths thereof in our day-to-day -day Christian living. We praise and thank thee for the family of Brother Benoni Richards who have created this forum whereby the universal church is blessed. I call upon your special blessings to be poured upon each and every participant. There are 14 of them today. Bless them, O Lord. Make them better Christians. Make their testimony so attractive wherever they are working, wherever they are studying, wherever they are doing business. So much so, unbelievers are drawn to you. In Jesus' holy precious name we pray. Amen, amen, amen.